Good evening again. Galapon Axon, Sodo Ada, welcome to the Somali Civic Participation Forum. And we are sorry that we're running a little bit later than we planned to begin, but we're going to get started. Um, the dinner camp is going to be served uh, from now on. And in the meantime, we'll continue our conversation. We'll get, you know, we'll begin uh, talking and, and, and discussing our agenda for the day. Isn't it pleasant to see Muslims playing right here at the heart of Ohio at the State House? Somali being spoken at the Ohio State House. How is that? First, I would like to thank all of the sponsors of this event, um, Abdirsaq, Abdirsaq, um, Saeed, um, uh, Abdirsaq Ahmed, Hawa Warsame, Osman Gele, all of the different people who have helped. I would also like to acknowledge the support of Khadra Mohammed of the Center for Somali Women's Advancement, Abdi Sofi of the New Americans Initiative, Ahmed Ali, of the Somali Political Action Group, and Amanda Robinson of The Ohio State University, without who this would not have happened. Thank you very much. Please give them a round of, of applause. <laughs> the Somali community in Ohio has made massive strides in economic and social participation in Columbus. Somalis were the largest group of refugees from outside the Western Hemisphere to settle in Ohio. From a, re a new refugee community just a decade ago, the Somali community is now working hard to find its place in Ohio. Somali can undertake social change initiatives in areas such as increasing Somali college enrollment through annual scholarships, reducing infant mortality in our community through healthy literacy campaigns, and promoting Somali participation in economic, social, and political fabric of our state. The goal of this forum is to engage in a conversation around the Somali incorporation in Ohio and spark action to achieve better civic participation. Dr. Stephanie Chambers has conducted a comparative study of Somali communities in Ohio and Minnesota, and one of her findings was that Somalis in Minnesota are way ahead in terms of political participation. Socially and economically, the two communities are the same, and we will hear from her today. And this is not to complain, this is not to you know, point fingers, this is to come together and to discuss the findings and to come up with ideas for making things better for the Somali community here. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chambers, for your scholarly contributions to the field of economic, uh, community incorporation and for choosing the Somali community. Your research has inspired the Somali leaders like myself to take action and seek solutions. We brought together leaders here, leaders of the Somali community, elected officials, policymakers, from state, local, federal uh, offices. In order to understand the situation, the Somali community is ready to do its part. Uh, that's why I'm proud to announce the Somali American Leadership Initiative, a new program of Somalican that will provide fellowships to 10 young Somali leaders in Ohio in order to develop a talent pool to advance the interests of the Somali community, but also fight against all forms of hate and take action to make the city, state, and the state a welcoming place for new Americans. Today's forum marks the beginning of this new initiative. And I will count on the support of each and every one of you uh, to really make this happen. The work of Somalikan has been supported over the years by so many generous sponsors. Um, I can see people from the Columbus Zoo, people from Franklin County, people from Denison University, people from the Ohio State University, uh, the Flickinger Legal Group, um, the Columbus uh, Community Relations Commission. I can see Carla and Abdi Sofa in here. Thank you very much for your generous support, as well as the many uh, community members who always stand with our initiatives. I would like to acknowledge that the Somali community has friends at all levels of government. We have a, a representative from the office of Priscilla Tyson, the president pro tem, 
a good friend of the community. We have um, State Representative Leland here, uh, who is really a good friend of the community as well. He has hired the, Soma uh, the first Somali legislative aide here at the State House, Aisha. Uh, Bernardine, I can see um, a number of uh, people who are really friendly with, with the community. Now, the Somalis are making progress. We are not just sitting there and waiting for somebody to help us. Actually, the theme, the reason we like the research that Dr. Chambers did is that she's not just looking at the problems that Somalis face. She concedes that policymakers only look at new immigrants as problem people. That's not true. We also bring something to the table. And we will talk about some of those things today. I will have um, Abdi Risa Farah talking about the contributions, the policy contributions that new Americans are making at the federal, national level, local levels. We will have um, uh, Abdi Khair Sofa talking about Somali integration in Columbus. We will have uh, Ahmed Ali of the Somali Political Action Group talking about Somali political activities and incorporation. So we will have uh, discussions around all of this, but we will also have the keynote speaker who will give us the findings so that we can all get together, come together, and stand up to change the situation for the better. Thank you. Adin, who has just arrived. Uh, also, Herschel Craig. That is a, can you stand up, Herschel? How did I not see you? He is a Somali, by the way. <laughs> Look at that. He has been a supporter of the Somali community when he was at the city council, and now he's at the state house as a state representative. He's, he's one of our supporters. We have, um, representative who? Ben and Kenny, yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> we also have Mr. Gilligan, Joe Gilligan, uh, from the Senator Sherrod Brown's office. Thank you for joining us. I would like, now like to talk to bring Abdi Sofe to the podium to say a few words about what he's doing, what his office is doing, what the city is doing to make Columbus a welcoming city. Welcome, Abdi. Good evening. Uh, I don't know if you have noticed, but he started some Somali words. He said Gallup one accent. So the key one accent is good. It's a, and it's, you can open and, and use it in so many different situations, like Gallup one accent, having one accent, which is good morning, good evening. If you know one accent, write it down somewhere the chances are you can communicate with a lot of different situations. Well, my name is Abdi Sofe. I work for the city of Columbus, by the way. My boss is in the house, Ms. Carla Williams Scott. Um, <clears throat> uh, the New American Initiative was founded by former Mayor Coleman to create an opportunities uh, for all New Americans. We have about every nation in the whole world represented here in the city of Columbus, 130 different languages. Uh, we have 150,000 foreign born individuals. Now, kids and the children that were born here in Columbus, not included. And to give you a little bit of perspective, that is larger than the city of Dayton, Ohio. Uh, that what makes the city of Columbus what it is a very diverse, multicultural, global city as it is right now. Uh, these people contribute the economy and the cultural diversity of the city of Columbus. Uh, we did a study uh, about a year, a uh, little less than two years ago. Uh, the direct economic input, Jibril mentioned a couple of things about the contributions of the new Americans. And the Somalis, as one of the largest groups in Columbus, play a vital role for that contribution. $1.6 billion of direct economic input. Imagine that. And $250 million in local and state taxes. 
And this is one of the reasons why the leadership of the city of Columbus, the mayor, uh, Ginter, and the city council are very excited about that diversity. Uh, that's why the mayor says, I don't only want you to feel welcomed, but I want you to feel embraced. And this is your home uh, because of the blessings of the financial contributions that these people bring. Uh, I know Professor Chambers, welcome back to Columbus. I know you're Columbus side, you went to Ohio State University. Uh, and thank you also for sending me a free copy of your book. I'm gonna buy a couple of more tonight. I encourage everybody to get their copies. Uh, one thing that uh, a few articles were being circulated about the book and Columbus lagging behind. What people don't understand is Columbus is receptive to the ideas, the new ways of doing things. If we are missing any opportunities, that's why Mayor uh, Ginter and the city council are aggressively uh, seeking and uh, soliciting inputs from the stakeholders, the community stakeholders. Uh, there something that we're missing. Can we ask the local stakeholders their opinion and inputs uh, so we can improve their areas? Uh, a new department was created, a department of neighborhoods that's where I work. That's the, the leader of the department sitting right there, uh, Mrs. William Scott. And the motto is many neighborhoods, one city, one Columbus. Uh, those neighborhoods are represented for so many different ethnic groups uh, that make Columbus what it is, a global multicultural city. Um, I want you to know that uh, if there's any new opinion and inputs, uh, the, the, our keynote speaker will talk about tonight is something that we really, we see as an opportunity so we can learn from you. Columbus has been a leading uh, champion for diversity and inclusion. Matter of fact, uh, I know Abdi Fair is also in the house. We'll, we'll talk about a little bit. We have been asked for our uh, best practices to share uh, in many different countries uh, for the past Four years, I traveled about seven or eight uh, different countries in the European, Western European community. I've been to Belgium, and UK, and Netherlands to talk about Columbus and the New American Initiative, what we do here, what works for Columbus. Uh, we also want to learn from other cities like Minneapolis. Uh, what are we missing? How can we increase the particip civic participation? Uh, so, uh, Looking forward to hear uh, from our keynote speaker. I want to thank our host, uh, uh, Professor Jibril uh, uh, Muhammad. He has been a really a great leader for our community. Uh, we're proud to support some of the Somalian programs. Uh, the education, uh, Somali graduation and scholarship program is one of those programs that we take pride in supporting for the past uh, five years or so. He's doing an amazing job giving a round of applause. And um, thank you so much for, uh, for giving this opportunity and platform. This is going to be a uh, continuous uh, conversation um, so we can uh, encourage young people to participate uh, the political systems, uh, public service, uh, and so on and so forth. One thing that people don't know is there is an election coming up. Does anybody know the date? How many of you know the date of that election? Raise your hand if you know the date. If you don't know, don't, don't. And that's what we're talking about. A lot of people don't follow the elections. And, and when the, that election day, what's the vote, voter participation rate? How many people actually go out and vote? Was it 8% the last time? And, and that's, what, what does that say about us? And this is not only something that, again, Somalis, I know the Somalis actually tend to participate higher than any other community, is for all, all, all our Columbus community. Uh, we have a moral obligation to vote. We have a moral obligation to take the responsibility in our community. I know I exceeded the time. Thank you so very much. And uh, congratulations to Professor uh, Chambers and to Jibril. Thank you, Abdi. Uh, by the way, the research and the book that Dr. Chambers wrote was in part inspired by the support of former Mayor Michael Coleman, who asked Stephanie, who actually told her that he was looking for ways to help Somalis get more involved in, in the public sector. So, I mean, we do not lack the support, but we just want to do more. 
Thank you very much. Now I would like to invite someone who worked with the former mayor, who now works for the federal government, who is always standing up for Somali uh, youth graduation sponsorships, a, an entrepreneur, a, a somebody who is Somali from Columbus who worked at the mayor's office and now who is providing policy advice to the Department of Homeland Security in the U.S. Welcome, Abdi. He's speaking on his behalf right now. Thank you, Jibril, and, and thank you, Professor Chambers, for writing the, the book and organizing this beautiful event. I do apologize for my attire. That's number one. And the second portion is that um, I, I thought Jibril was such an old friend of mine um, for about 15, 16 years, but now I realize we're not having me squeezed between smart people and showing how dumb I sound sometimes. So thank you, Jibril. Um, let me express a deep appreciation for the book because some of the questions hopefully that those of us who read will learn and get answer uh, to will be something that has eluded us for quite some time. I have been lucky enough for the past seven, eight years to travel around the world and around the country and anywhere I go, I have taken every step possible to connect with the Somali communities there in the diaspora, whether it's in the European Union, uh, whether it is in the U.S., uh, Minneapolis, Columbus, St. Uh, Paul, um, San Diego, and elsewhere. And one thing I realized was that the ingenuity, the creativity, the entrepreneurial spirit of the Somali communities else, everywhere is about the same. Uh, they are all cut from the same cloth. Very smart people, hardworking, value education just the same whether they are here in Columbus, Ohio, or in Minneapolis, uh, Minnesota. Having said that, let me also disclose that I am not speaking on behalf of the U.S. government. When I'm standing here, I'm speaking as a citizen of this great city of Columbus, Ohio. So whatever I say, I can be held responsible for it, but not for anybody else for that matter. Um, and, one, and I want to share, just to conclude, because I don't want to take too much time, a um, couple of anecdotal information that I have come to realize and uh, notice in terms of the differences between Minneapolis, Minnesota, and St. Paul, and here in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, you, you see, I have been lucky enough to travel to Minneapolis at least seven, sometimes five times a year, as I have been also coming to Columbus, Ohio often enough because here is home. And when I first went there, the civic participation of the Somali-American community in Minneapolis and St. Paul wasn't as great. Uh, it was also a time of a little bit of a difficulty because there were a significant amount of investigations going on there. Both the federal government, especially the FBI, Homeland Security, the Department of Justice, everybody who worked there at DC and elsewhere were going to Columbus, uh, were going to Minneapolis along with their grandparents because of that investigation, just to find out what was going on. Um, so it was a time about seven or eight or nine years ago when both the federal government and the local and state authorities and the community wanted to understand each other and learn from one another and maybe bridge the gap between them. That could have played a role in terms of the progress that the communities made. But seven, eight, nine times ago, there were only maybe one or two police officers who worked for the Minneapolis Police Department. Now you look back 10 years later, there are about 35 or 40 police officers from the community who work there for law enforcement agencies in the community. That is not where the participation for election, elected offices. There are a lot of young people who are civil servants who are working there. So one thing I notice is that it is not easy to walk through a closed door. At least the local leadership, state and federal, especially state and local, ought to open the doors for the community so that they can walk in. There are a lot of smart people here also. Um, so while there was a significant need back then in Minneapolis and St. Paul for the local communities and the Somali community and law enforcement to understand each other and open the door and allow the community to sit on the table and dictate some of the terms of the way the community has been governed along with everybody else, Columbus wasn't also that different. The same challenges and needs were being faced by the community here. And I will share another example that also tells this story about why the Somali community, especially when it comes to civil service, here in, Minneapolis, in, in, in the great state of Ohio, is not as great 
as in Minneapolis. And that could be to this small story. Every year, I have been lucky enough to organize and support young people from Columbus, Ohio, to go to Washington, D.C. to understand civic participation, to understand how the federal government works. And they have been lucky enough to meet with elected officials from elsewhere. For example, when they go to Minneapolis, when they go to Washington, D.C., they will meet with you know, government officials from the different departments. They will visit the White House, and then they will visit Congress. And many a times it would happen that elected officials from Minneapolis would welcome them into their offices and spend about two or three hours to sit down with these young people, middle schoolers, to understand how their government works. While it has been a little bit difficult for them to meet with elected officials from Ohio. That is a food for thought that we should always take home. Why is it that these doors, especially from Columbus, Ohio, from Ohio, from Dayton, is a little bit difficult for this community to walk through? It ain't any different than the communities that we find in Minneapolis and St. Paul. Um, the communities are just as smart, as hardworking, value education, well-educated, and contribute to the local vitality and economic development and growth of this community here. They just do as good. But why is it that the congressmen and women and senators from Minnesota would welcome this community in Washington, D.C., especially young people from Columbus, Ohio, when it becomes a little bit difficult for them to meet with their own elected officials from their own state. As a matter of fact, some of the young people, when they come home, come home with two messages. The first one is that, I want to join public service. I really want to do what these people have done. And their second question is always the same, every year. How come we couldn't have met with our own elected officials? So uh, I hope that that message will hopefully resonate and the questions to these, uh, the answers to these questions will be answered by the book and the author. And I hope that young people and this community will not get tired of continuing their participation in the civic engagement. I think this is a discussion that's really needed by this community, that's really needed by this state and by this city uh, for this community to be part of the fabric of this American society and this great state we really need everybody's uh, participation. I see young people who have been very active in politics and thank you very much for all you do. I think Small Steps continues to work uh, towards the betterment of the community and I, I really applaud everybody who's here. It shows and it is a testament to the effort by this community and thank you so much. I would li now like to uh, invite a Somali businessman, Abdirazak Ese. Where are you hiding? Okay, here. Uh, Abdirazak is a uh, businessman who employs dozens of people and he is a success successful Somali businessman. Welcome. We will talk about the Somali business participation, economic activity aspect of things. Thank you, Jibril. Actually, that's my dream, but I'm not sure if I'm still there. Um, um, let me begin uh, by thanking all of you um, policymakers, um, elected officials, both state level and federal level. I had a lot of elected officials, but I do not remember all of their names. But I do know a lot of them, especially uh, Franklin County and City, uh, Columbus City, elect officials. So it's a pleasure again to meet you here, some of you that I know for a long time. Um, I would like also to uh, uh, thank uh, business leaders and the business owners and community leaders who are here today to support you this great event. Um, in order to understand uh, Somali Americans here in Ohio, it's a very important to understand in Somalia um, and Somali people. So in order to understand how American, Somali Americans are doing, I think it's very important to go back and understand a little bit how about Somalis and how Somali does and what good trades they have, good trades they have. Um, Somalia uh, can be understood 
to the entrepreneurship for Somali people. Um, it is not 2,000 years old nation or country, but for many centuries, they traded through the world, from China, India, even Europe. So uh, those of you who are not Somali and want to know a little bit about Somali, Somalis are known to be an entrepreneurship people. And when facts that proof is my point is you can look here in central Ohio, specifically in Columbus, not mentioning uh, Twin Cities, which was um, which I have been there many times, but it's amazing me after I read Stephanie's book uh, that gives me a lot of inside information that I was not even aware of. Um, but going back to the, my point is here in Columbus, uh, uh, as I mentioned, in Somali uh, people has an entrepreneurial skills, and that skills they go everywhere they go, and they broke to um, here in Columbus and Central Ohio. There are about 900 Somali businesses, including but not limited transportation, education, technology food service, healthcare, and financial service. Um, the, as a result of Somali business activities, an entire area of Columbus has been revitalized. And you can see Somali-owned malls and big shop centers. Of, uh, you can see that. Um, uh, Somali, um, the Somali-American contribution Economic contribution uh, is a signif are significant and a positive impact on our uh, communities, uh, to the first Somali communities. And um, Somali American devised all the acts to create opportunities and achieve a great success while fertilizing our neighborhood. And Somali Americans have the courage, ingenuity, and creativity. And because of this, Soma Columbus residents are not only appreciated that they are inspired by Somali traits and how well they do it. As a business owner, I'm very confident that this Somali community has a promising future. And to say this, because we have high level of business ownership, a workforce participation, college graduation, and this advent important advantage will of course translate it into tangible uh, economic, social, and political participation in the community in the future. In conclusion, the economic contribution made by Somali Americans are significant and should not be denied or disappointed. Rather, they should be encouraged, acknowledged, and supported because that is what makes this beautiful, beautiful country and one of the greatest nation of the earth. Thank you. Thank you, Abdesak. Uh, I would now like to call on Khadra Mohammed of the Center for Somali Women's Advancement. Khadra is the founder of the International Women's Day at the High State House. She is the one who established the tradition of Somalis coming here every year on March the 8th to celebrate the progress of women. Welcome, Khadra. We also have, we don't have shortage of, of brilliant Somali women in the room. We have a former Central Bank Governor of Somalia, Yusuf Abrar, in there. Yus. I think the U.S. and a few other countries have female Central Bank Governors. It's not a common thing. So, uh, thank you for coming, Yusuf. Good evening. I'm happy to be here tonight and to have the opportunity to hear from keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Stephen, uh, Dr. Uh, Stephanie Chambers, about her research on Somali uh, incorporation here in Ohio and Minnesota. I would like to thank 
everyone who attended here tonight. Um, it's very important to dialogue. And I will also like to thank Professor Jibril Mohammed for his leadership and for putting this important and timely occasion together. Thank you, Jibril. We are very grateful to have him in our community. The event is one of the ways in which the Somali American community in Ohio is trying to raise its voice to seek greater representation in the public sector at all levels of government. From townships to city to county to state to federal level. The author and the other speakers will go into detail in business ownership, employment and educational attainment. A significant number of Somali women were able to start their own businesses, often without any support from outside the community. Somali women have unique ways of supporting each other through social networks uh, or to, to, through social networks that collect this money and support one woman at a time. They were able to support each woman at a time to, uh, to get her business off the ground. The businesses they own include clothing stores, restaurants, and childcare centers. Somali women in Ohio are creating local jobs and contributing to the tax basket. They are also bringing Ohioans together to fight for the rights of women and children. For example, the Center for Somali Women's Advancement established the annual tradition of celebrating International Women's Day here at the State House every year on March 8th. While acknowledging Thank you. While acknowledging this progress and support, I would like to point out that Somalis in Ohio feel left behind when it comes in political participation. I look forward to hearing from Dr. Chambers some practical ideas for changing the situation. I also hope that our elected officials will take a note for her recommendations and will work with the Somali leaders, Somali community leaders, to make our government look like the people it serves. We all want to achieve a shared, peaceful, prosperous society where there's equality for all and secure future for all children and young people. It's my hope that this forum will produce ideas to increase Somali civic participation in Ohio. Thank you and enjoy your meal. I would like now to invite um, a young Somali who is active in the political arena who will talk about Somali political participation, any challenges, any opportunities that exist. Ahmed Ali is the president of the Somali Political Action Group. Ahmed, welcome. Good evening, everyone. Assalamu alaikum. Before I start, I would like everyone to please, once again, uh, give a round of applause to uh, Professor Jabril and Somali Khan for hosting this amazing event. Um, they did an excellent job representing the community here. Both our elders, our young people, and the women are all present. So thank you so much, uh, Professor Jabril. Um, so my name is Ahmed. Uh, I am the president of a group called Somali Political Action Group. Um, this group is also known as SPAG. I started it last year um, in July. Um, after I came back from a short trip in Minnesota, um, it was around this time in April where uh, in Minnesota I noticed 
that they were very engaged politically and socially, of course. Uh, but when I came back here, I really was kind of disappointed how our community was doing. I didn't see that much involvement or engagement, or maybe I just wasn't aware of it. So what I first started doing is I tried to go to some Somali events. At that time, it was the primary season. So I had the chance to go to a couple of different events in the community. Uh, the first thing I noticed was that I was the youngest person in the room. So uh, that was one thing I always noticed every time I would go to Somali uh, community events with uh, candidates or elected officials. The second thing is that many of the people who were there were just mostly middle-aged Somali men. So I still felt like our community wasn't represented uh, in those type of forums or in those type of events. Um, what I did after that is I decided after primary season, let me just try to start getting engaged. Let me try to reach out or talk to someone. Luckily, um, I remembered Shannon Harden, or Council Member Shannon Harden, from an event that I went to, and I reached out to his office, and I was like, hey, I want to meet with you. I want to know about city council, and I want to be involved. Um, you know, luckily Shannon was very welcoming. He introduced me to all the other council members, um, told me if you want to be involved and get active, there are other groups to get involved in, such as Central High Young Black Democrats. Um, I still felt like, even though that group was amazing and I'm part of it, I think that I still wanted to get all the younger Somalis involved and part of the discussion. So that's when I started SPAG, or Somali Political Action Group. Um, we started, like I said, in July with a group of about five people. Um, I remember when I sent out the text messages and I told everyone to come, we're starting this group, I sent out, I think, 30 text messages and only four or five people came. So at first it was kind of a, um, it did make me feel a little bit upset, but I didn't give up. Uh, we had our first event in August. It was a event, kind of a community conversation, if you would say, to continue the dialogue, not only during the election time, but after that. Um, Luckily, we had Council Member Jaisa Page come to that event. Um, we also had other members of the community. A lot of young people came to that event, so the demographic did change. Um, and we just kept continuing those community dialogues and community conversations. Um, we also not only did community dialogues, but we had an event um, in January where we, there was a huge famine going on in Somalia. So me and my fellow SPAG members, we ended up raising $13,500 to help with the famine in Somalia. Uh, we've gotten a lot of recognition from a lot of young people who want to join our group or who want to be part of the, uh, this discussion. We recently received an award from Central Ohio Young Black Democrats. Um, and I would uh, like to also say that one of the things I learned with creating SPAG or just getting involved is it really starts with yourself. If you want to be involved or if you want to get active politically, um, yes, we can point fingers at times. We can say, we're not included, we're not on the table, this, this, and that. But it really starts with you. It really starts with you going out, talking to your uh, elected officials, give them a call, email them. If they don't answer, if they don't reply, then wait till election season and, you know, <laughs> don't vote for them. <laughs> But um, definitely just start the first step, be engaged. Um, I think a lot of the elected officials I met, they were always willing to help. Uh, they were really kind. I would like to also say that there are two elected officials in this room who's been very uh, helpful when we were doing SPAG. One of them is uh, State Representative David Leland. So he came to all of our events, he was part of our discussions, he stayed throughout the whole event, and he hired one of our SPAG members, Asha, who works in his office. So <laughs> thank you, uh, State Representative. Uh, a couple of other people, one is of course Council Member Shannon Harden. He's uh, been a mentor to me, he helped me, uh, offered me an internship in his office and he's been very instrumental with SPAG, so uh, thank you so much for that. Um, and also, uh, lastly, is people like uh, Jabril, who's willing to work with Somali Political Action Group, including us in this discussion. Uh, people like Abdir Zakfar, who's willing to have young Somalis step up to the plate and encourage them. Uh, uh, Director Carly Williams Scott, who I went to her office, and she talked to me about being part of the, uh, the neighborhoods department program, being on your area commission, and Abdi Sofia. So the list goes on and on, and there's many great people. But I would definitely like to conclude with: um, if you really want to be involved, if you really want to be engaged and active, start with yourself. You know, look at who your elected officials are, contact them. Don't wait till election season, and you know, start now. Thank you guys so much, and have a great rest of your day. I would now like to call a young Somali leader, um, Mushtaq Duale.
Mushtaq is a former president of the Somali Students Association of the High State. She built the organization to become a really vibrant organization to the extent that it hosted a national conference this year. She built the infrastructure, the, she put it in good shape. Mushtaq will be talking about young people's aspirations and, and, and the state of young people, young Somalis in Columbus, and then we will get to our keynote speaker. Welcome. Good evening, Assalamu alaikum. Hi, my name is Mashtaq Ta'ala. I am an American, I am Somali. Two cultures play tug of war with my identity, yet ultimately fuse to develop a third dynamic and hyphenated one, Somali-American. That sounded pretty, right? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> it is my ancestry and the conflict found in Somalia that have largely contributed to my interest in global health and social welfare. My background and travels have enhanced and augmented my own story and so given me a level of comfort and familiarity with a multitude of people due to our common values, due to our shared experiences, and the general interconnectedness of living in this era. Um, I have a mission to be an advocate, uh, an advocate of change and to help develop interventions that eliminate barriers to health. Uh, these past few months, I've been working with a local nonprofit called My Project USA, uh, based in the West Side and the Hilltop community. We work hand in hand with youth um, and adults from refugee and immigrant backgrounds. Um, it's an initiative that addresses issues like human trafficking and drugs in a vulnerable community, um, as well as fostering coalition growth, advocating for community members, and developing empowerment programs in a food bank every Saturday. As a citizen of the world, I see great value in acquiring a deeper knowledge of public health. As the world continues to globalize, it is imperative that we work towards inclusivity and that we work towards creating more opportunities for people within the immigrant background community, immigrant refugee community. Uh, during the entirety of 2016, I lived in the rural state of Kelantan in Malaysia as a Fulbright Fellow. I served as a cultural ambassador for the United States and I attended a number of functions. Thank you. And attended a number of functions where I spoke uh, on my Somali American identity, the diversity present in America, the Muslim American experience, and I furiously worked to dispel the notion that to be an American is to be a white Anglo Saxon Protestant. And of course, I heavily spoke of the ongoings of the 2016 election, and I tried to subside some fears. Alas, the fears came true. Anyway, um, <laughs> for 10 months, I taught English to secondary students with very low levels of English acquisition in a conservative state that I likened to Alabama. Um, when not teaching English, I spent free time observing the local clinic um, and the treatment of it, um, a move to what I consider the heart of the United States. I went to a local school, elementary school, Madari Elementary School, right off of Hudson. Um, before we moved to, I moved to a Sunrise Academy, a local Islamic school in Hilliard, Ohio. Um, and then finally I became a student at Hilliard, in the Hilliard City School District where I met Abdi, who was a phenomenal leader and a voice who really pushed a lot of us into civic engagement and political participation. Um, so, yeah, in a, in a number of ways, I grew up very fortunate. Perhaps not monetarily, but definitely I was fortunate in the access that I had to wonderful people and the opportunities and the esteem my family placed on education and every individual that saw fit that like we all needed to succeed, that they cared uh, to see us all succeed. And ultimately, I ended up at Ohio State. I graduated there a couple years ago. My point in sharing all of this is to illustrate the great promise and potential in the Somali people in Columbus, Ohio, potential and promise that we have already begun to see. Albeit a relatively new community, many of us have come of age here, Buckeyes through and through, and we have accountability for our homes here and our families back in Somalia too. Our black and Muslim identities have marked us for countless acts of discrimination over the years. I myself have many stories to share on that matter. Yet still we rise. Morse Road and parts of Cleveland Avenue are jokingly dubbed Little Mogadishu by my friends, and the West Side is home to. In the summer, yay! 
and the west side is home to an Islamic center that was very largely funded, almost entirely funded, by the Somali community itself. So I think that's something we should applaud to too, yeah. So we are, an active, we are active in our centers, we're active in our schools, in our communities. We have begun to shove our feet deep into the soil of Ohio, and so goes the story of any other classic start of an iconic American tale, right? Immigrants digging their deep, boots deep into the ground, settling in and saying, hi, I'm home, and this is where I will grow and rise. Thank you. I would like to have all of the elected officials, as well as their representatives, I can see Mr. Gilligan, and as well as Carla, come back here and welcome the keynote speaker with me. Please, yeah, come, come in. So, um, okay, so this is what we want to make sure. All of these wonderful people will have to read a copy of the book, which I will present to each one of them. Now I would like to invite the keynote speaker, Stephanie Chambers, to share her findings with us. Welcome. So thank you for the introduction, um, Jabril. Thank you so much for having me tonight. Um, this visit has meant a lot to me. It's sort of the culmination of a, a lot of years of research and work. So I want to thank him specifically for all the kindness. But there are many others in this room who I also want to thank. Many of you uh, sat with me, did interviews with me. And um, you know, sharing your time is the most valuable thing. And I appreciate that. I've learned so much. And I'm still learning. So I don't claim to be the expert on Somalis, of course. There are a lot of things I'm still learning. But I was able to use my skills as a political scientist and my background as somebody who does racial and ethnic politics and urban politics to look at the Somali experience and try to get a sense of what is going on in two regions of the United States. So thank you all for coming out tonight to hear a little bit about my work. So, get my clicker here. So, um, with so much attention on refugee resettlement throughout the world, the subject of how best to incorporate those who have suffered due to uh, war or other humanitarian tragedies is a very timely issue. My talk today speaks to refugee incorporation in new communities. My research was driven, driven by my interest in not only identifying what, was go, what is going on for new immigrant communities, the Somalis in particular, but also by an in, interest in guiding policymakers in terms of how better to incorporate these new Americans. So I looked at the Somali experience in the two areas where they're, where they're the most heavily concentrated, in um, oh, the Twin Cities uh, of Minneapolis and St. Paul and Columbus, Ohio. So Somalis are often viewed with suspicion in the communities that they call home. And this largely stems from a very small handful of incidents involving Somalis accused of terrorism that have, incre that have received a lot of national attention. I argue, and I think everybody would agree with me, that far from representing the Somali-American experience, these events are outliers. The more important story is how Somalis have taken jobs in struggling communities like Lewiston, Maine, and brought back the economy because they were willing to take low-skilled jobs, go live in apartments that had largely been vacant, and bring back the economy, but also in places like Columbus and the Twin Cities that are economically strong communities, as you pointed out, but Somalis have just made those, sort of solidified the strength of those areas by contributing to the economy as business owners, but also as people who work in warehouses and as janitors and as cleaning staff and keeping the service sector economy going in this, in this, in this region. 
But beyond these economic benefits, Somalis also participate in our democratic system as voters, candidates, as civil servants. More importantly, Somalis contribute to the rich diversity in our communities and help teach people about other cultures. So despite these and many other examples of the positive contributions of Somali Americans, we remain inundated with negative news about them. For example, during a campaign stop in Minnesota, then candidate Donald Trump reiterated many of the misperceptions about Somali refugees, stating, here in Minnesota, you've seen firsthand the problems caused with faulty refugee vetting, with large numbers of Somali refugees coming into your state without your knowledge, without your support or approval. He went on to falsely state then that everybody's reading about the disaster taking place in Minnesota. And the reality is far from the picture painted by the president. So my hope that is that by sharing my findings and some of the research that I've done, that I can paint a factual portrait of what's the great contributions that Somalis have made, but also the areas where we can do more to improve uh, opportunities for Somalis and other new Americans in this country. So many people are interested in why, I'll take the slide down, I'll put this up, this is a better one. Um, many people are interested, they say, you know, why, you know, obviously I'm, I'm a non-Somali, but why did you get interested in this topic? Well, I was drawn to this study initially because I uh, got my PhD at Ohio State back in 1999, and I came back here in 2012 to do a paper on, that with, or a, a book chapter in a, in a book that's on uh, minority mayors of majority white cities. So I came here, did, did my book chapter, did my field work, and I was doing interviews in the black community, and what I noticed was there was this significant change, I, this noticeable change in the population. And I just, as a political scientist, I'm curious about these types of things. And I was like, what? when did Somalis come? Why did they come? How are they faring politically? And so I ended up um, coming up with a paper topic that was um, an investigation of Somali political incorporation in Columbus. And that's when I started doing my field work and started interviewing Somalis for this project. And <clears throat> it was this, this quote that I'm going to put up that, that sort of uh, signifies things that I was hearing from a lot of my respondents. I have friends in Minneapolis, and it's a much more welcoming place for Somalis. People are friendlier, and my friends seem more connected with non-Somalis. That is very unlikely in Columbus. And along similar lines, uh, mayors from across the country were going to Minneapolis, largely Minneapolis, but the Twin Cities, to learn about um, what, they called the, what, what people call the Minnesota success story as it relates to Somali incorporation. Um, but it's not only um, elected officials from across the country that are going to the Twin Cities. It's also people from around the world. So I encountered two Swedish delegations when I was doing field research, and they were like, what's going on in Minnesota, and why is it so great here? And I would say, it's, there are some things that are going really well in, in the Twin Cities, but, but, but be careful about that, because there are also areas where there still needs to be significant improvement. And I'll talk to you about what those improvements are in a little, in a little while. Um, so I designed this study comparing the Somali experience in these two regions to determine whether there were in fact different incorporation outcomes in the two areas. I wanted to identify the reasons for the difference and then I wanted to create policy recommendations that could ultimately help Somalis and other new immigrant groups. And my early research in Columbus had already indicated that Somalis were struggling in, in Columbus. And I could see that there was more that policymakers could do and part of this was because of my training. As an academic, I know that there are structures and institutions that have and continue to create barriers for underrepresented and marginalized groups in American politics. And so I could see some of these factors at play in Columbus, and I wanted to uh, understand them a little bit more. So to evaluate the differences uh, between the two regions, I collected a, a, a bunch of quantitative data. Um, there were some problems with data, which I can talk about if you're interested in, with, in the Q&A. But, um, but I collected things like um, indicators on household income, poverty rates, employment rates, um, home ownership. But I also did a lot of field work, uh, participant observation. Some of you saw me around or heard about me. Um, I did interviews with 57 people in Columbus, largely the majority of whom were Somali and 78 interviews in the Twin Cities. So my research, my field work was done between 2013 and 2015 in Columbus and 2014 and 2015 in, in Minneapolis and St. Paul. Now I know, I think most people in this room are aware of this, but I'm just going to present a, a brief overview. So 
Uh, in terms of understanding the Somali diaspora, beginning in 1991, tens of thousands of Somalis fled their home country due to a brutal civil war. Many traveled to refugee camps in Kenya later, and were later assigned to new refugee resettlement locations in the US and other places in the world. So here is a picture of Columbus. In, for other audiences, they don't know what Columbus looks like sometimes, so that's Columbus. Um, you all know it. Um, and had a page here. Um, although Columbus doesn't conjure up images for most Americans of an internationally diverse city, it is, it is now known as a new gateway. Um, and so we see that there have been many Latino, Asian, and African immigrants who have settled in this city. And it's now home to the largest Somali diaspora. So I have a couple of uh, uh, bullet points up here. So Columbus is a new important gateway city. There are about 30 to 45,000 Somalis in Columbus, uh, a city with a population of 836,000. Somalis are largely um, uh, concentrated, primarily concentrated in the northeast and west side of Columbus. And I mention this because residential concentration is an important factor when I talk about political incorporation, uh, when we talk about opportunities. Um, and the other thing that I just mentioned is that, that um, that Columbus, Columbus was an important secondary migration city for Somalis who were settled in other places first, largely because there were jobs, low cost of living, um, affordable housing options in, in this area. And finally, the city of Columbus has been called recession proof. This is not my term, but I, I found it in, in the scholarship. And um, so the city has reacted to economic change in a very positive way. So in the 1970s, when you had Rust Belt cities that were floundering because the economy was changing, Columbus quickly you know, responded in sort of a nimble way and became a, um, you know, sort of transitioned into a service sector economy but maintained some manufacturing. Um, and so they've done, the city has done very well, also with the businesses that are located here, it being the state capital, Ohio State University is here, and so forth. So it's been a strong economy, and this will come into play very, in a, in a few minutes when I talk about the Twin Cities as well. Okay, so here we have Minneapolis-St. Paul. And um, together, Minneapolis and St. Paul comprise the 14th largest um, metropolitan area in the United States, United States. Each of the cities is an independent municipality, but the close proximity sort of muddles the distinction between the two. St. Paul serves as the state capital, and Minneapolis is the most populous city in the state and home to the um, flagship institution, the University of Minnesota. Today, the Twin Cities are home to the largest Somali population in the US, about 60,000, and the population of the Twin Cities together is about 700,000. Somalis are also residentially concentrated in the Twin Cities in certain areas of Minneapolis in particular. However, what we've seen is that people are moving, Somalis are moving more and more out to the suburban inner ring, you know, the inner ring suburbs because the cost of living in Minneapolis is going up and it's, it's hard to get housing that's affordable in this city. Um, and similar to Columbus, the Twin Cities has an economy that is economically resilient. Um, it is, it is, uh, oh wait, did I skip something? Oh, yes I did. It, it's been an attractive secondary migration city um, because of job opportunities at the time when, when there were, there was, well, at, at, at certain times the cost of living was relatively reasonable. It's gone up re more recently. Um, but there are, there have been a lot of jobs, especially for people who have low skills and, and needed to move to find good jobs, or decent jobs, I shouldn't say that they're necessarily that good. Um, there is a history of refugee resettlement. The Hmong were resettled largely in St. Paul in the 1970s, so the region has had some familiarity with helping people get back on their feet. And finally, economic resiliency is another important factor of, of, of the Twin Cities story. Um, it has, they have, they have had a strong economy, lots of corporations located there, major corporations like Target, 3M. Um, they've also provided generous social welfare benefits to people. It, that's changing a little bit, but um, they also have a strong public education system, experience low levels of crime, and boast this reputation of being something called Minnesota nice. Um, and so, and, 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 and so economically resilient region as well as, uh, as Columbus. 
Now to measure incorporation, um, I looked at 14 different indicators that fell into three categories of incorporation. I was interested in political, economic, and social incorporation. And the reason I looked at th these three areas was that I was arguing, or I argue, that, um, that any improvement in one of the areas of incorporation can create interrelated and mutually reinforcing um, uh, increases in incorporation in other areas of incorporation. So there's sort of, um, uh, there are concomitant improvements in the, the various areas of incorporation, and hopefully you'll see that as I go through and talk about my indicators. So I don't have time to talk about all 14 indicators with you. What I will talk about are a few of the indicators in each of the three categories of incorporation that I looked at. So I'm going to start by talking a little bit about, and I am happy to talk about any of the other areas, any of these other indicators, if you want me to later. Uh, but they are in the book as well. So first I'd like to talk about electoral structure and talk about the differences that I found between the two regions. So political scientists argue that electoral rules are not neutral. They all have consequences. And the Twin Cities uses an electoral system that is ward-based, so the candidate who receives the plurality of the vote in an individual ward wins the seat. Um, they also use a single transferable vote system allowing, candidate, allowing uh, voters to rank order their candidates in, in, in preference, in terms of their preferences. And this is, both of these are methods for increasing the opportunity of underrepresented groups to win elective office. And this isn't the only factor that contributes to the, the success that Somalis have in, in, in encountered in terms of electoral um, structure. We also saw in 2012 that there was a, a, some movement among, uh, it was actually organized by a Somali man to get the Minneapolis Charter Commission to look at the ward structure and to create something called opportunity wards. And the argument was we have Somalis concentrated in certain communities, but yet they're not able to elect someone from their community to the city council. And the Minneapolis Charter Commission was open to the ideas that were being put forward by, by, these, by this, this group. And they ultimately changed the ward structure. And in the next election, there were three individuals elected for the first time to represent the Somali community, the Hmong community, and the Latino community. So that was a, a huge step forward, and it really started from the ground up, but it was also that there were receptive policymakers who said, yeah, actually there is something that's, that's leaving these, these folks out, and we want them at the table. So, and I actually just heard, I was just in Minneapolis, and I heard um, the new city councilwoman who's Latina speak at the conference, and she's a dynamo. She's really, she's a pretty interesting person. Um, so in contrast, as everybody here knows, Columbus uses an at-large system for municipal elections, and this means that candidates must run citywide. And this, this presents a challenge for racial and ethnic minorities. It's not something that can't be overcome, but it's very difficult, and the, and the, and the path to overcoming that is very, is, is, takes a long time. And so again, we have a majority white city. We still see in this country, unfortunately, that there are differences in the ways that different racial and ethnic groups vote, so that creates a, a challenge. Um, there is some hope. I, I think that there is interest in the community, as far as I could tell when I was doing my field work, in trying to come up with a new structure for elections in Columbus that would open doors for new people to come, come into city office. Um, the other factor that I want to talk about is that, that, is, that really stands in contrast in Columbus and, and, and the Twin Cities is the role of political parties. So in Columbus, you have the Democrats playing a large role in local elections at the local level. Uh, in Minneapolis and St. Paul, the Democratic Farm Labor Party, which is a more progressive wing of the Democratic Party, is, has control at the local level. And the DFL, I'll call them the DFL from now on, um, they, are, they have um, made a concerted effort to nurture and elevate Somalis who have been interested in political leadership. And that was something that was really fascinating to me. And it's not only the Democratic Farm Labor Party, actually the Republican Party there is also interested in Somalis. And part of this stems from the fact that Somalis vote in high numbers. I don't have any official data on this, but I was always hearing about 80% of Somalis are voting. So in, in contrast to local elections where we tend as Americans to vote in low numbers, 
I'm not saying that Somalis are going to go out and vote in high numbers in this next election, but one never knows. Um, it seems like Somalis take the, the right to vote very seriously. And so the DFL plays um, an enormous role in helping Somalis who are interested in running for office. So in contrast to what I found in the Twin Cities, I was hearing things like this in Columbus. Elected officials come visit us when they want our vote. Otherwise, we don't see them. We don't bother going to City Hall because they don't care. Um, and I'm sure they weren't talking about any of the folks who are sitting at this table because you guys are here, right? And you're not here because you want people to vote for you. You're here because you care about these issues. Um, but, but I think that there are others who do turn up at events. And I have seen this firsthand when somebody comes to an event and says, oh, you know, make some welcoming remarks and then then goes into why they should vote, why you should vote for me, you know, that sort of thing. And, and I think that that's, a, that that's a problem. So individuals in this area make, make you know, will we'll reach out to Somalis as individuals. But the party itself, the Democratic Party, which has control here, doesn't seem to be doing anything to try to bring th forward Somalis who might be great leaders. And I think that that the leaders are there, the party just needs to do a little bit more to do some, have some support and do some outreach. The DFL in contrast, I had um, one of the DFL representatives who was so excited to talk to me and provided me with so much information, he said, I would say to some degree the delegates are suckers for candidates who in our eyes exemplify the American dream. We were the first to endorse a Somali candidate in 2010 and subsequently had the first Somali elected official. So I would say we do our best to welcome them with open arms. And the Somali um, elected officials that I interviewed and the candidates who ran under the DFL label said the same thing. They said, oh, the DFL was really supportive. They, they created opportunities for us. So I think that that's something that's really important that, that, that could happen in Columbus if the Democratic Party I don't know that the Republicans would be as interested, um, but Somalis tend to be Democratic voters. The Democrats should be paying attention to the Somali community. Hand in hand with um, party is the issue of unions and union engagement. And there's another stark difference that I found between the Twin Cities and Columbus, and that is that um, Somalis are largely unionized in the Twin Cities. So jobs like um, uh, you know, people who are in, well, I should also mention the Twin Cities, a big, a, a big field is the meat processing uh, business. That's where a lot of Somalis were drawn because they were jobs that people didn't, they, need, they didn't need much in terms of English skills. Um, but also Somalis are concentrated in, um, under SEIU 26, which is the Service Employees Union 26, uh, as security workers, janitorial staff, housekeeping staff, um, home health care employees. And SEIU has not only brought Somalis in as union members, but they have elevated them into leadership positions, hired to do important policy work, right? And SEIU seems to have that in mind. And their connection with the Democratic Farm Labor Party has been an important thing that has helped with um, Somali political incorporation. And I have a quote here from a Somali respondent, being part of the labor and progressive movement helped many of us acquire tremendous political expertise and connections. Um, and so the absence of unionization and leadership opportunities for Somalis in Columbus is, is problematic in my mind. In fact, I had resp more than one respondent who told me that when she tried to unionize, she was met with retaliation and threatened in terms of losing her job. I also heard from CARE, the Center for Arab Islamic Relations in Ohio, that they take a lot of cases that deal with uh, religious discrimination in the workplace. Whereas in the Twin Cities, not that it doesn't happen, but that you've got the unions that can also intervene and provide support for people who are facing discrimination. So I think that there's, there's more that the unions could do here. Um, so overall, I argue in the book, and you'll see this in, in chapter four, that overall in the Twin Cities, incorporation levels are higher than in Columbus. Um, I'm not talking about this in any detail right now, but I will say that the New American Initiative is one of the reasons that I give Columbus, in terms of bureaucratic outreach, moder a moderate, um, because that's an important office that, that has provided some important um, services for people and help. There's a lot of research in my, my field about um, what we call street level bureaucrats and how they can really help people at the local level. And, and I would say that that is taking place here in Columbus. 
In terms of economic incorporation, I'm just going to touch on two factors, household income and public-private programs. But before I get to household income, I want to say one thing, and it goes back to the economies in the two, two regions that I was looking at. Um, first of all, Somalis came uh, as refugees with the ability to seek legal em employment almost immediately once they were settled. And so, and many refugees don't hold advanced degrees. Many of them were denied the opportunity to get advanced degrees because they were in these refugee camps um, and have come with limited language, English language skills. I know that many people have also overcome that and have learned English um, and are, you know, ha have done very well with that. But, and also there are people who have, who came with advanced degrees that were not recognized in this country. So there were already some employment challenges that Somalis were facing. Um, but they went to these two communities that are economically resilient, that are economically strong. And if we think about the number of years that Somalis have been in these communities, you would hope that Somalis would be moving up and, you know, getting themselves out of poverty, right? Because these areas are so economically strong, even in recessions but yet that doesn't seem to be the case. And I don't have longitudinal, longitudinal data here, but I have a snapshot. And so the median Somali household income level is staggeringly low in both communities, both the Twin Cities and Columbus. Poverty remains a major barrier to economic incorporation for Somalis. In 2010, the federal poverty line for families of four um, was below 22,050. And Somali families tend to be larger than four, families of four, so it's not uncommon to have families of six to eight. And if we focus on median income or the midpoint, um, Somalis in the areas that I was looking at are, were making between eleven and $13,000 a year. Um, and this level of household poverty adds to the forces already stacked against Somali economic incorporation and financial security. And it also speaks to the dire need for economic opportunities. The next indicator of uh, economic incorporation that I look at is uh, our public-private partnerships. And during field work for this project in the Twin Cities, one economic factor that stood out to me as a really distinguishing feature was the African Development Center, or the ADC. This organization is a social profit, community developer, and commercial lender. They work primarily with Somalis, but they work with anybody in Minnesota. Um, and they provide business development training, low interest loans for small businesses, home buyer workshops, financial literacy training, and all of these services are provided in a cult culturally sensitive way that gives clients lending opportunities that are compliant with Muslim religious teachings that include restrictions on interest bearing loans. And even more noteworthy than the ADC's work is that they have partnered with City Hall and the, ma the former mayor's office initially started this, Mayor R.T. Rybeck. He he learned about what was going on at ADC and the importance of these Islamic compliant loans that take the principal and the interest and put them together and then the borrower pays back one sum. So it was a way to create opportunities, lending opportunities um, for Somalis so that they weren't taking their personal income, investing in a business that might fail and then losing everything, right? And so R.T. Rybeck, the mayor, was very moved by this and thought this was a great great program, so he partnered with ADC and they created a loan program that was a partnership between the city and ADC, and it also got philanthropic support. So the philanthropic community said, oh, that's worth investing in. And ultimately, ADC has given out, or has, has, has issued uh, 400 small business loans. They have a 0.5% default rate among all of their ADC clients. And this model has been looked at by other cities. I know people here are aware of ADC. Um, and something like this in Columbus could go a long way in opening doors for, for people in this community in terms of their economic opportunities. And um, so overall, I, I argue that it's a real mixed story in terms of economic incorporation for Somalis in both areas. So whereas the Twin Cities does slightly better, we still see tremendous room for growth. And I, I don't have anything up here about home ownership rates, but what I will tell you is that Somali home ownership rates are about three to five percent, depending on which area you're looking at. Columbus, or the, I'm sorry, the, the state of Ohio. I could only get it at the, the data at the state level. Um, Ohio, Somalis in Ohio have about a five percent home ownership rate, whereas the, uh, the, the rest of the Ohioans are at like 76 percent. And I think this is an area where um, Somalis are sort of locked out of traditional ways of building equity in the United States. And this is an area where we could see some improvement. 
Finally, in terms of social incorporation, I'm only going to talk about um, two factors. I've already mentioned that, that Minnesota has a history of welcoming refugees. But um, what I will say about, about social incorporation um, is that I'm really looking at the extent to which a group is accepted by mainstream stream society and the group's perception of acceptance in the host society. And I would say, although I, I argue that social incorporation is higher in the Twin Cities, Somalis in both regions under investigation, again, have room for growth. So I'm going to start with a, a, a small quote. One day a Somali woman was caught speeding, said Mukhtar Abdul Qadir, a Minneapolis police officer. A police pulled her over. She was so nervous and fearful while she waited for the police to come to her window. Then she glanced out the window. Realizing the officer was a Somali, she said to him, oh, you scared me. I thought you were a real police officer. <laughs> So this quote alludes to the community's fear and frustration, right? But also the importance of the inclusion of Somali law enforcement officials. And you already mentioned this earlier, the, the, the expansion into law enforcement of um, Somalis in the Twin Cities. And my interviews revealed this really interesting difference between Somali attitudes about local law enforcement versus federal law enforcement. And what I found in the Twin Cities was that local law enforcement, although it wasn't like Somalis were like, the police are the best, you know, there are still problems and Minneapolis and St. Paul still have problems with police brutality. But, but my respondents were like, yeah, there are some good things happening in the, you know, in the police departments and in, in the local police. Federal law enforcement, attitudes toward federal law enforcement officials were overwhelmingly negative. In Columbus, they were negative in both areas, federal and, and local. And so I was thinking, well, what is the difference here? And the difference, I argue, is that um, Somali police officer, officers play an important role in the Twin Cities. So at the time of my research, there were seven Somali officers in the Minneapolis Police Department. Um, there was also a woman in the um, St. Paul Police Department. And this is just a picture of the Cedar Riverside neighborhood of um, Minneapolis where Somalis are concentrated and these are two of the Somali officers. Um, I ended up doing a ride along with, with these two guys. You wouldn't think that a political scientist who is trained at Ohio State, you know, a highly quantitative department would be out doing ride alongs, but I, uh, I did and they were very gracious and, and took me out, but I had the benefit of seeing the way that they were received in the community and it was amazing. Um, you know, kids running up to them, people on the street coming up to them to shake their hands, to talk to them, to share information. Um, and not all of the officers work in the Somali community. Uh, only a few of them have decided to go back to the community where they were raised and they're working there. But one powerful thing that I saw during that evening that I was with them was that there was a young Somali woman who had been assaulted across town in a different area and she drove with her family all the way over to the Cedar Riverside neighborhood to report the crime because she wanted, she felt that they would be receptive and understanding of what had happened to her. And what the officer said is, well, other officers might send the person back to the area where they were assaulted, but we'll take her and we'll, you know, they, they took the report, we took her to the hospital. And it just spoke to me, you know, a lot about trust. Um, and the other thing I wanted, oh, yes, okay, so, so, the first Somali officer in Minneapolis was hired in 2006, and these officers, as they've grown, have established something called the Somali American Police Association. They established that in 2012. And this national attempt, uh, uh, organization attempts to provide a network of support for Somali officers, and also uh, works as an informal Somali police recruitment organization. And they've gotten attention all over the world, really. They've spoken in Toronto, and. Um, and they've, they've, they've been a great organization, I think. One, uh, oh, and I should also mention in St. Paul, there's an officer, and they adopted, they were the first to adopt the snap-on hijab, and so this is a great thing in many ways. So the police department did this so that, you know, just as police officers wear the snap-on tie, so you can't grab an officer by the tie, I don't know if any of you knew this, it comes off because it's a snap-on, I didn't know that before, but the hijab is the same thing, so you, so, you know, it's a simple way to accommodate someone's religious beliefs and allow them an employment option. So St. Paul has this, um, and that's important. So I have some quotes um, from, the off from officers that I interviewed. When I got on the force, I wanted to call someone and ask them questions about the profession. I had nobody to call. When we became six 
officers in Minneapolis, we decided to form a group to help others coming up. And this same officer said to me, I still remember the first day of law enforcement training when this Eritrean officer came to my class. He was in uniform and I had a chance to speak to him. It made a big difference in my confidence. Seeing someone who looks like you is really important when you're trying to do something like this. And this, for me as a scholar, was really important because it aligns with all of the research in the women in politics literature, in the minority politics literature, that says that role models play an important role in increasing opportunities for groups. So I thought this was just one of those great quotes that I... sentiment among those, those interviewed, like I said, was very positive about the Somali police. But even within the police department, I also heard similar things. So here, um, one of the non-Somali respondents who was a high-level police administrator said, they are celebrities, rock stars. They've gotten us into a community that often has distrust of police. They opened doors and facilitated conversations between police and the community. This has created trust and credibility with people who had an issue with law enforcement. And the Somali officers also told me that their non-Somali co-workers have asked them questions, you know, have said like, hey, I don't think I understand this about the Somali culture. So they've been able to deal with misperceptions and myths, and it's been a great thing. Now, as you know, I'm sure most of you are aware, um, the Columbus Police Department still doesn't have any Somali police officers. And there was a woman who had gotten through the police academy, but the department wouldn't, wouldn't um, adopt the, the snap-on hijab. And this is another area that I argue is a simple one that Columbus could adapt, make a change. Uh, St. Paul got positive recognition for the work that they did in terms of gender equity, and religious accommodation when they adopted the snap-on hijab. This is a simple thing that can open doors for people. And it's also, a, these types of jobs are the jobs that can propel people into the middle class. So I argue that this is really important. And finally, in terms of social incorporation, I wanna talk about the role of the philanthropic community. So the Twin Cities have about 120 charitable foundations. So it's, it, they're a unique area. Okay, that's a lot. Um, Columbus has about 30. So big difference in terms of sort of the history and um, philanthropic giving, right? But still, um, these foundations in the Twin Cities, I didn't go into this thinking that I was gonna look at phil philanthropy so much, but when I was looking at community organizations, because that was one of my indicators of political or incorporation, was the capacity building within Somali community organizations, I realized that in the Twin Cities there were a lot of organizations that were getting philanthropic support. Um, and even the Brian Coyle Center, which is right in the heart of the Cedar Riverside neighborhood, which is where many Somali organizations are headquartered, and it's a community place where kids play basketball, I mean, it's a great place. Um, that was funded by the Pillsbury Foundation. Um, and, you know, so many of these local community organizations have gotten funding and grants through these foundations. And in Columbus, that's not the case. So a lot of the community organizations here are, are funded by individuals who are you know, generous to one another and, and fund their organizations, but there isn't a lot of funding that's going to the groups. And so I argue that this is an area where we could also see some growth. And in my interviews with foundation representatives in the Twin Cities, I heard things like, we take this responsibility seriously. We ask ourselves who is missing from receiving grants, and we make sure there's an awareness of the opportunities. Many of these foundations also have Somalis on staff, so language barriers are not an issue because the foundations feel like that you know this is a priority. We want Somalis as part of our part of our you know our workforce. Um, oh, I should also show you something before I move on. The other thing that I was just gonna oh, I hope I have it here. Well, maybe I don't. Okay, I do. So I don't have this on a slide, but I got this from the Minneapolis Foundation. And in the early 1990s, they did a public service campaign where they had like signs on buses and, um, and they were trying to raise awareness of the great things that were happening in terms of immigration to the city. And this has a picture of three women on it. And it says, maybe you're just not sure what to make of these new Minnesotans bringing all these strange new cultures and customs. But hey, have you ever really thought about Ludafisk? And Ludafisk is like this Norwegian, maybe, maybe Norwegian, like the gelatinous fish that people eat in the Twin Cities. And so in any case, it's just, it's just shedding light on, you know, we all have our things that might seem unusual to outsiders and to others, but let's embrace this. So you have these foundations that have taken a real interest in highlighting the diversity in the communities 
and sort of you know saying let's raise awareness of it and let's embrace one another and learn from one another. So that's another real positive thing. Um, I heard in Columbus, I got one response from a foundation representative that said Somalis don't apply for grants. And so my argument is, you know, more outreach can be done in the way that some of these foundations in the Twin Cities are actively prioritizing getting new groups into the, you know, act to the table. So overall, I say that, you know, we have some moderate incorporation in, in terms of social incorporation in both areas, but, but certainly room to grow. Um, and so, I guess what I'll say in closing is, going back to my notes here, uh, to some degree, my, my, uh, my Columbus Somali respondents were correct that things are better in the Twin Cities. Um, definitely in terms of political incorporation, economic and social, it's a little bit more mixed. Um, but the final chapter of my book goes through recommendations that I make uh, for increasing Somali political, economic, and social incorporation. And I really hope that this book helps policymakers th think through ways that we could, in a very simple way, increase opportunities for Somalis and other new Americans. Because I think that is the goal that we all sort of share, those of us who are committed to democracy, who are uh, who really value the opportunities that, that one can have in the United States. And I also think that, that the issues that I raise in the book have unfortunately received more attention because of policies that the Trump administration is pushing and the targeting of Somalis and the travel bans. And I think that raising awareness of the benefits of new immigrant communities is really important today um, more than any time uh, in the past. So thank you very much for your interest and for listening to me. Bismillah. Manto hanal kan ku qabarnay shir ku saabsan Soomaalida Ohio iyo Soomaalida Minnesota ilmi baaris lagu sameeyay iyo isbarbar dhig lagu sameeyay waxa la soo ogaaday in Soomaalida Ohio ay ka yara dambeeyso marka loo eego ka qayb qaadashada arimaha siyaasadda oo Soomaalida Minnesota ay aad ugu horreeyaan ee sababihi keenay arintaas ay laga wada hadlayay waxaan isu keenay dawladii magaalada dawladii gobolka dawladii federaalka ahayd أمدي سومالية دوحي وحقراني أخيارتي علمدي متعلمينتي حوينكي لأن يرضي كل وحان مركا كوضع هذا لني وأنصوبا لني علم بارستاس نتيجة دي رنتي نوال إسلاقاتي إن لو باهي هاي إن إسبد اللو قصة مايو لدامك سومالية دو هايو يكغيب غادة شدو دا عرماء سياسة دا وحالو قادي مركا سببتي سومالية دو هايو يكغيب غادة لا دا هاي عرماء سياسة دا معاها إن سومالية دو هاي سياسة دا إن سومالية دو هاي كدوين كو منصوتا سيستمك أو هاي كجراء يا كدوين سيستمك منصوتا فور تسالاحان منصوتا وحالة قدورتا صدحي طبان غف أو أغلق سيتي هول كي جوغا صدحي طبان كاس غف مدو البوك مدو حلقة صدر دورتا حافظ جارة إلى يسدون كنا غف بعض عضيس حلقة أوهايو لقد دورت تتوقف ومدو البوك مذا وهل مليون غف عتقو درات سنة يوم مركا غف سومالي هنا وهل مليون غف عتق هلا ويات كانيسا لكن صدون كنا غف هنا عتق هلا ويسه هل نانيسا من صوت فرصة سياسة أوهاي سيد لوجه الجلين لها وحول نوع الطالة ما أنتوا حنس مني إن مركو حنس بعاني إن ضد أنا جنا تاجيرة ضد سياسيين ضد لدورتي ضد مضحة وفدرال يلاكل يستيد يكل إيه مدحتوي دي قبل كان جونا يستيد هاوسكي هل كان المركو كسب عندك نور بهنتي قبل دي بوك قرطي ستيفني تشامبرس ولا بعض مجال ولا تكتي أو ربهنتا أو روسي أي حاجة رنتي جواب تي دي نتيجة دي دي صوب عندك تي مركو رنتي أرنا هذا غروح بدن يا عشرف هذا ونكسب بيه هيد وأنا وحن رجعنا إن يثبت لو كل عدانه أرنا تسوم على ذا أوهايو يخيب قلك وضع رماسي يا صدق نقالها يبل شدبه السلام عليكم أعداق عبد الرزاق شيخ علي وير ونحن تمرك كود وحن شاء الله ورتينا نادو قوم هاد عليو جبريل وسوقة من قابية هاوشاني مرك الله بعد وحن الله يحي قبل داني بو قاية قرطي وحن تي افتي من ايسا فرق عودة حي السلام عليكم كنا اول مقالة دان كولومبس يكو كنا اول مقالة وين كما تانها سيدا بوغا كو عدنا وحي موشينا يسا إن سومالي ذا لبدا مقالة كو كالنول أي حاجة وح برشادة حاجة جناسية حاجة قونتة دنولي بيسك جميدي هين لكن وح كلا هرمري أو كلية إن كلية هين مقالوين كي كلية دقي هين مقالين الدت كمعناه هي لكتر أوفيشلز كلا جسور دورتو أي هين دت سومالي ذا سودا وي هل كوا كلا أي هين كوا الباب ذا كحرتي مركعات بنو فرع سنة أي إن بوغا أنا أي كورت سومالي ذا موشينا يسون إن الدت وجوه أنا هي ستاي تاي دت كلا لقد دورت مقالة ذني وما سن. 
الحمد لله وصلاة سلام رسول الله إن شاء الله تعالى وحارة ومركور إنه أمد علي ولا لاسو قبن قابي أرنتين برنامج كان إيو دكتور رد برنامج كقورتي أو دكتور ستين تشمبر هذا هو مدعنا بوك بيسيك لمانتا وحلقة هاد لها وحي إيهات كمبير وحيكو سميني سومالي دا دقن من السورة إيو سومالي دا دقن كولومبوس وحيز بربا دك سومالي دا من السورة إنه حوو كهر مرسنتا هاي سومالي دا كولومبوس دقن أو هاي دقن إيدو ميالا بادن فيريسي لكن إن شاء الله تعالى وهيجا هاد وجد إن شاء الله تعالى وحار من هذا نوي هاف هوب إن شاء الله تعالى وحار جيني نا إني دنيا تتصو صعوتة وحبدي لدون تدو إلهي راه ذا وهو ما سنت هاي مراسبة وحياة هاي مراسبة جبر دراسة هاي سماي سي لقصة بندقة يي بوجي أو إسبوع بندقة مقالة ذا كلام بس يي مقالة ذا مينيابلس الحقيقة ذي عاد بان أوقع عني وركي حكتي أي جبر أسوأ بندقتي وجبر بروفيسور ذا أو جامعة تريني يونيفرستي مناسبة الصومالي كان يبروفيسور جبريل محمد أيا مرتجلي أو سواق من قابي ما هذا بدن هكذا جادو مركز سيدا سهيد مناسبة هذا قروح بدن بها سيدا كار كسيدا مسوره هذا يموغالة ده تك شوقة ماشاء ده مهم وهم ده حاجة جالية ده يو ده مضحكة دك ماذا يو سكوبل كبا كسوق يبقى لين بهذا مركز سيدا سكون بدوار ما حسنته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله عليه وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم ما عيق وعاد غني شق على الدين ويا ووحنا كم ده يجنا عزت هذا دكان مقالة ده وهايو أنا ما أنت واحد إنه هل كانوا نميد إن أنه كقيب قلنا سو بندقة دبوجي دكتور ستيفن أي سو بندقة أي أولو سلوس كوبر بردقة يي لبعض استيد استيد أوهاي استيد مينيابوليس كومونيتي كسومالية دخور مركوضة وحسوسار كوضة أقوان توضة إيو سيدا أي سجوع حري هنا كونكشن كاي أولي هنا فرنتي لبعض كومونيتي مركا أي سبر بردقة أي دكتور ستيفن واحد موجنا يساين كومونيتي كا مينيابوليس وكهريو كومونيتي كا أوهاي لكن تا معنیه دو ماهان این ایداد کو گرشهان یا قوانهان ای اوجوه هریان، لکن وحمیش و کتیر وحوی سیدا ای اوکلا فرفرینیهین استاید کلا بادا استاید ما مولا ده کتیر سیدا ای اوکلا فرفرینیهین اما ای اوکلا اینترست گرین ایان بلشه دا کنولی کمونیتی دا کنول. وحد مودا استاید اوهای استاید منیابولیس کمونیتی دا این ما مولا کو اینترست گرین ایو و دونه یه هرمر کودا یه وحصوصار کودا اسلامر که اصلا او معنوین و گوفریه دور شده یه عت کودا و گوفریه. لکن استاد و های او واحد مدعی نه البته دو ایس حیرین سیدا ایت المانتی ولی با دکتر استیفن ایت المانتی و آد آرکیسو این ایسان اوفر ناین البته دو ولکم این ایسان کسی بینین. لکن بلشه دو ایس کمیت وحصوصار کن و ایس کمیت سیدا نامیسن نای ولو ایسان این بدن و داده ادو فر بدن ایسان و رایسان. لكن مركز الله يسبر برد قال بده كومونيتي مجال هذا عنه ويقدم بيسي سو دقيت أنا هان مركز الله جه الله يو كومونيتي كمن يا بوليس سياس دراد ديد وحن هو أركا إني لبده كومونيتي إسكول أدو ينحق وحسوس أركا أنا ما سنت مركز يقول حالي بشير نور حسن لويان وحن كم ده هدت خصوم عليه ده كونه المجال هذا كلام بس هايو عاون هل كان وحاول نميت and presentation هي سمينة سجبر بروفيسور هذا أو كم ده أو دكتور جامعة الله كم ده دلك مراكنك أو كسم هي research there داد کشور مالی دکونه کولومبوس هایو یا کوس مالی دکونه مقاله کولومبوس اینا این مینیسورا استیت اف مینیسورا و حیا و بدن به سبب نکتی و او به هن مرتی این دیپلو فیریو قاب کشور مالی دو قبیله کران اینا عرما سیاست دا گرعسیه ای هر مرک جود دل مراکن که بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم مقاله و حوا دکتر سکوسر موسا و حکون ولای قبل کان کولومبوس هایو اینا و حشرف و نیا اینا مات قبلو این بوجا الوفرة إن استيت كا قبل كا أوهايو إن وحالوجا هاللي رنتي أهرم بدن أو يشك نتوسع وحقبة كسومالي ذا إللي ذا هاي يدلي لها بق إن وحكلام مهم نوع أمانت إن أقرصنا يان إن استيت ربرستيت في سكنة أقرصنا يان سومالي ذا وحقبة كذا مركي لكم كم بردجنا أوهاي إن أوهايو قبل كمنيا بالسيوجانا يان ديفرنت كي فرق جود حياة لبضة قبل وحن رجعنا يا إن إسبد الله إيمان دونان إن أوهايو استيك ليدرشيب كذا إن إن شاء الله صوم مالذا نروح أقول رجينا يا إنس استيقانين أي شقذ وذان دذالان هديتها دن كستا دن كحبرشلا دن كبزنس